Drop Dead Fred tells the story of Elizabeth, played by Phoebe Cates, a young woman down on her luck after she loses her job and her husband and is forced to go back and live with her overly controlling mother, whose life is about to get a whole lot more crazier and out of control when her childhood imaginary friend called Drop Dead Fred returns to her life to run havoc and to help her try to regain control of her life by turning it completely upside down with all manner of wacky comedic shenanigans. Anigans. Played by British comedy legend Rick Mail and released in 1991, Drop Dead Fred utilises the fast-paced, energetic, manic style of humour that Rick Mail is most well known for, and tries to reach this style of comedy to an international audience. Which, although it didn't work at the time, the movie's increasing cult following has seen many fans who love and adore this wacky oddball supernatural comedy. Which also stars Carrie Fisher as Elizabeth's best friend Janie, and Tim Matheson as her slimeball husband Charles. The question is, can Fred help Elizabeth get control of her life, or will his out of control antics completely destroy her sanity? There is only one thing that can save this young lady from the hardships of her life. British comedy! Yep, bring in Rick Mail from The Young Ones. So today we are going to look into 10 things that you may not know about Drop Dead Fred. The only movie in which you never would have seen a man more happier to have dog poo on the heel of his shoes. So let's celebrate the talents of Rick Mail and Phoebe Cates and check it out. This would be good for the wine gala. Yeah, it looks like a big bruise. Number 10, Rick Mail Transatlantic. Drop Dead Fred was not only Rick Mail's first attempt to break into Hollywood, but it was his first major theatrical film role, with him starring in the lead. Although he had already had minor roles in movies such as An American Werewolf in London and Shock Treatment, Mail was most well known for starring on the small screen on British TVs, what with hits like The Young Ones and The New Statesman, along with the comic strip presents. Although Drop Dead Fred has a fan base of lovers of the movie who just can't get enough of it or Rick Mail's off the wall manic performance, back when it came out in 1991, the movie got destroyed by critics who just didn't quite know what to make of Rick Mail, so thus they didn't like him. Although the young ones did have a fan base in the States before Drop Dead Fred went into production, I think the wide public in general weren't ready for Rick Mail's mania. I always feel like in Drop Dead Fred, even though he's an imaginary friend, he's basically a watered down PG version of Rick from The Young Ones, where he delivers his fast paced comedy style and surprisingly even has warmth to his character when need be. Although Mail's Hollywood career didn't take off, he returned to British TV, where I think his talents really shined, where he would go on to make Bottom, which many fans believe is one of his greatest, if not his greatest accomplishment. Number 9, the best director for the job turned it down. For all intents and purposes, Drop Dead Fred is a capitalisation on not only the talents of Rick Mail, but also the oddball supernatural comedy genre that had seemed to have started with Beetlejuice and continued with the likes of Little Monsters, where we would see a pesky supernatural guy who is full of all kinds of comedic wackiness. A trend that would go on throughout the 90s. Well, seeing how it was a trend made popular by Hollywood's Prince of Darkness himself, it would have only seemed natural to ask him to direct, as Tim Burton was offered the position of director for Drop Dead Fred, but turned it down. I guess you can't blame him. After all, he had Batman Returns to make. It's almost a travesty, as I think Tim Burton would have brought out the best of the movie and made it the best that it possibly could have been. After all, the movie does have that sort of Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands vibe about it. 
I guess you could almost say that Drop Dead Fred is the greatest Tim Burton movie that Tim Burton never directed. I'm not saying that Drop Dead Fred's director, At De Jong, did a bad job, because he doesn't. It's just the movie would have been right up Burton's alley. However, Drop Dead Fred may not have gotten the vision of Tim Burton. It did, however, get the sound of Ghostbusters. Number 8. The composer of Ghostbusters 2 provides the score. So as mentioned, Drop Dead Fred was a supernatural comedy product of its time, and who else better than to get the composer of Ghostbusters 2 on board to provide the music for the movie? The score was composed by Randy Edelman, who just two years prior provided the score for Ghostbusters 2. Edelman's score provides plenty of heart and soul, along with comedic mania to keep up with Rick Mayle's energy. In fact, some of the musical cues that are heard when something oddball or magical happens sounds very similar to cues that were used for Ghostbusters 2, and ones that he would then go on to subsequently use for the mask. Edelman is a professional of his trade, providing musical themes for many other movies, such as Twins, Kindergarten Cop, The Last of the Mohicans, Billy Madison, and Triple X, to name but a few. Number 7. Drop Dead Fred could have been a Disney movie. Even though Drop Dead Fred has its kind and warm moments, particularly when Fred isn't rubbing dog poo on the carpet or sinking Carrie Fisher's houseboat, the movie might have been just that bit extra warm and gooey and family orientated with a lot less swearing and rude jokes, as at one stage Disney picked up the script for Drop Dead Fred and were happy to go ahead and make the movie. They did have two requests though. A, the movie was to star Goldie Horn, and B, they didn't want Rick Mayle in the movie. So Disney's offer was rejected in favour for keeping Mayle in the lead role. Even though Disney makes some pretty badass movies nowadays, I can't help but feel like had back in 1991 they got their hands on Drop Dead Fred, then the movie would have been somewhat neutered, and played out as a much more safe and family friendly movie, but who knows. Yeah, the movie's title may have been changed to Fred, the Magical Imaginary Friend, or something like that. Number 6. New Line Cinema saw Drop Dead Fred as a comical version of Freddy Krueger. Even though Drop Dead Fred was filmed in America, mainly in Minnesota, the movie was actually a British production, made by Polygram Entertainment and Working Title Films. However, the movie's production had a tough time finding a distribution company to release the movie internationally. Drop Dead Fred was taken to Miramax, Orion Pictures, MGM and 20th Century Fox among many others, all of whom turned the movie down as they either didn't like it or didn't understand it. Drop Dead Fred was even taken to Geffen, whom had previously distributed Beetlejuice, but they didn't want a bar of Drop Dead Fred as they found it too similar to Beetlejuice. So the movie was then taken to the home of Freddy Krueger, New Line Cinema, where it was shown to founder and producer of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, Robert Shea, who sadly also hated the movie. However, fellow New Line Cinema executive Sarah Reicher loved the movie and saw the Drop Dead Fred character as being a comical reverse of Freddy Krueger and convinced Shay to distribute the movie. As it just so happens, that very year, New Line Cinema was releasing what was intended to be the last Nightmare on Elm Street movie with Freddy's Dead. So the company was looking for a new character to take on the mantle of a wise-talking supernatural being. So Drop Dead Fred was picked up by New Line Cinema for that very reason. So there you have it guys. If it wasn't for Freddy Krueger, then Drop Dead Fred may not have been released. It seems kind of insane that Drop Dead Fred was even considered to be Freddy Krueger's replacement. Does that mean had the movie been a success then there would have been Drop Dead Fred's sequels? Number 5. Method to the Madness Many people have noticed over the years that there actually is somewhat psychological logic to the madness of Drop Dead Fred. That the movie may not just be a wacky comedy where Rick Mayo looks up women's dresses. The panthers. No, panthers. The 
it. But in fact, Drop Dead Fred might actually be a dark tale about a young woman having a psychological breakdown and identity crisis, which causes her to hallucinate and see her imaginary childhood friend Fred. The theories claim that Fred and Elizabeth are in fact one and the same, and that Fred represents the boisterous, out of control side of her personality, who wants to break out and rebel to the tragedy in her life and break away from her restraints of her abusive mother and sleazy cheating husband. Fred is basically Elizabeth's psychotic breakdown personified. After all, when the movie was released in Britain, press papers described the movie as being about psychological liberation. An American composer, Carl J. Schroeder, gave the movie great praise and called it, quote, startlingly beautiful, and further expressed the Fred character as being poltergeist energy of Elizabeth's character's repressed self, her out of control ego who forces her to confront her pain. Wow, maybe Drop Dead Fred isn't just a silly, off the wall comedy. Maybe it is more psychological and intelligent than people give it credit for. Number four. Casting Possibilities Before Rick Mayle got on board to play Fred, Robin Williams was supposedly offered the part, but turned it down as he was making Hook at the time. Molly Ringwald, Julia Roberts, Leah Thompson and Renata Ryder were considered for the Elizabeth role, but the part went to Phoebe Cates, who at the time was best known for her role in the Gremlin movies. And in fact, just one year earlier starred in Gremlins 2. I actually read in a few sources that Kate's real-life husband, actor Kevin Klein, was to have a cameo in the movie, but it didn't end up happening. I don't know who he would have been, so take what you will with that information. Jeff Goldblum, Rick Moranis and Alec Baldwin were considered for Charles, Elizabeth's two-timing sleazy husband. But Tim Matheson, best known for his role in Animal House, got the part. And also played the part delightfully creepy. Keanu Reeves, Michael J. Fox, Anthony Michael Hole, and Josh Brolin were all considered for the role of Elizabeth's childhood friend and love interest, Mickey Bunce. But the role ended up going to Ron Eldred, who would go on to star in Sleepers and Ghost Ship. And Bridget Fonda has a tiny cameo as Annabella, the woman Charles is having an affair with. And her part was even uncredited and done as a favour for Phoebe Cates as the two were friends in real life. Number three, the comedic talents of Carrie Fisher. I think that often with Drop Dead Fred, everyone gets caught up in talking about the comedy antics of Rick Mail while completely overlooking Carrie Fisher, who actually really shines in this movie and has some great comedic moments. Originally, Fisher tried out for the Elizabeth role, but it was felt that she was too old for the part, so she was offered the role of Elizabeth's best friend Janie instead. Before Fisher landed the part, Beverly D'Angelo and Gina Davis were considered for the role. But Fisher brought a lot more to the movie than just her star power, as she actually rewrote a lot of her dialogue seen in the movie, proving that Fisher really had a great sense of humour with comedy talents that shouldn't be overlooked. Heck, the part where Janie thinks that she is fighting Fred but is in fact fighting nothing is one of the highlights of the movie to me, as Fisher proves that her physical and verbal comedy was a force to be reckoned with. And... Incidentally, in recent years, we have lost the great talents of both Rick Mayle and Carrie Fisher. Man, I still really miss them. Number two, unused movie poster. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. We are all familiar with the custom Drop Dead Fred poster, where Rick Mayle seems to be hanging upside down, looking all wacky and crazy, while Phoebe Cates looks on like she has no time for his wacky British comedy shenanigans today. Yeah, it's classic and has become a prominent image associated with the movie. But what about this not so well known poster? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> what are your thoughts? This one interests me, as it shows that not only does Drop Dead Fred seem to be taking over Elizabeth's sanity, but also the entire city. Yep, New York doesn't stand a chance, as it dwarfs with Fred looming over it. Move aside King Kong and Godzilla, Fred is in town. Admittedly, it would be pretty freaky if a giant Rick Mayle started to roam the city. Number one, failed remake. Touch. Yo, I told you, you can't touch this. 
For the longest time, there had been rumours that a remake of Drop Dead Fred was going to take place, with none other than Russell Brand in the role of Fred. Yeah, I don't know what to make of that. Yeah! I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to be sick all over you immediately. Lie down. I remember reading on a website in the early 2010s a list of upcoming remakes, and among that list was The Karate Kid and Fright Night, along with Drop Dead Fred. As we all know, The Karate Kid and Fright Night did get remade, but Drop Dead Fred did not. So how did this happen? How was Drop Dead Fred spared? How did it slip through the cracks to avoid this travesty? Well, popular belief seems to point at another remake Bran had starred in called Arthur, which was a remake to an early 80s Dudley Moore comedy. The Arthur remake performed so badly, the studio behind the Drop Dead Fred remake subsequently scrapped any ideas of making remakes of classic starring Bran. Sorry Arthur, I guess you had to take one for the team to assure that this one wouldn't get remade. So that was my look into Drop Dead Fred, and I can imagine that people who aren't used to Rick Mayo may find his manic comedy style in Drop Dead Fred to be alienating. But not for me, as I love Rick Mayo and I love his performance in Drop Dead Fred, as it always makes me laugh, and the movie at the end of the day has great heart and interesting psychological philosophies. The movie is a must for anyone who is a Rick Mayo fan or a fan of those wacky Beetlejuice inspired supernatural comedies of the late 80s and early 90s. Anyway, I'm Minty, and remember, the next time someone tries to tell you that Drop Dead Fred is a bad movie, you should just reply by saying, what a pile of shit. See ya!